Hi. Hi, everyone. So sorry for like the, the technical difficulties. Um, I hope you are still uh, still watching and waiting. Um, so we are connected today uh, through Matt Museum. Uh, I am Beatrice Leanza, hey. I'm the director of the Museum of Art, Architecture and Technology. And today we have here connected to speed it up a little bit, even we have lost a little bit of time. Um, we have Shannon SP who's joining us from London. Um, she is a, a DJ, an AR, and a co-curator and resident, and resident uh, at HyperDubs event at Corsica Studios. Um, welcome, Shannon. Thank you. Uh, also uh, joining us and uh, from Kampala in Uganda are Arlen and Derek, the co-founders of Niege Niege, who is the institution from uh, that is collaborating with us today. Welcome. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Bea, for this invitation. Hi, Shannon. We're really happy. And, and sorry again that we had to, you know, let everyone wait. Uh, this is completely on us. Sorry again. Um, but let me give a little bit of a two minutes introduction, you know, like to why we're here today. So um, today is International Museum Day, 18th of May. Um, and this day takes up a particular significance uh, because as many such places like Matt today, um, remain still closed. Um, and partly their survival is threatened by the economic repercussions of this current crisis. So uh, we wanted to take this opportunity to remind ourselves of the empowering role that institutions of culture can play uh, in society in helping fulfill our natural desire to be and feel part of a community. So today uh, we have um, a program, a special project, which is inaugurating uh, Matt's new music and sound program. This is the first instantiation that we have decided anyway to share with you online. Uh, and is great, curated by Pedro Gomes, um, who is a um, Lisbon-based independent music uh, professional. Um, and uh, Pedro has curated uh, with us the entire city that we hope to see unfolding in the coming 10 months. So uh, once again, sorry for uh, for this to everyone for this delay. Uh, without further ado, uh, I will let uh, Pedro come in. I will leave him, you know, my chair, respecting social distancing rules, uh, and I will uh, leave the word now to Shannon to moderate uh, this conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pedro. If you want. Mm -hmm. So. Pedro, are you going to say a few words or? Yeah, hey everyone. Thanks so much for waiting, for, for those who waited. And uh, hi to the three of you. Uh, it's a super, super privilege uh, uh, to, to be uh, connected with you guys and with uh, everyone watching. Uh, I'll be, be uh, very brief. This is about um, the, the two gentlemen uh, you also have on the screen. Uh, <clears throat> This music and sound program um, I've been collaborating, uh, collaborating with for Matt is called Stary uh, In English, it means angered lands. Um, <clears throat> it's mostly concerned with the uh, communities uh, um, which have been uh, for the most part uh, abandoned by uh, uh, Western world uh, urban standards. Uh, abandoned financially, abandoned politically, uh, ab abandoned in terms of rights, um, and I have, uh, in their own, uh, each in their own specific way, created uh, their own vocabulary, uh, their own culture, their own dialectics, uh, or recreated it or reconfigured it. Um, examples uh, of this exist all around the world for sure, um, but the, the ones uh, we're mainly focusing on <clears throat> uh, are impoverished, uh, mostly impoverished ones. So. Uh, not located in what is considered to be the first world uh, uh, in most of the cases. Um, we decided to, to start this uh, very strange <laughs> new reality that uh, we're all in right now uh, in terms of what this program is concerned uh, with the Niege Niege crew uh, who have been doing some really, really, uh, uh, you know, um, 
new kind of work for forging new allegiances that um, are, are quite uh, pioneering in both artistic terms and uh, in terms of forging new kinds of human collaborations, connections, etc. Um, I'll be here kind of uh, uh, kind of hovering over your conversation, but I leave it to you, Shannon, to, to do the, the moderation. Okay. Um, so, hi, guys. <laughs> hey, Shannon. Um, I think a good place to start is to find out a bit more about both of your backgrounds and how you ended up in Kampala to begin with, how you guys met. I think people would want to know that. <clears throat> okay, I'm gonna start. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, <clears throat> I ended up uh, in Uganda as a film lecturer in film theory and African film history uh, for the um, uh, film department here in the, you know, the local university in Kampala. Um, so I came about 10 years ago, uh, like that, and then Derek came to another like roundabout means. Um, yeah, around the same time, about 10 years ago. Uh, it's a quite a long story, so, um, but um, we met uh, as we were organizing events. I was organizing some, some small parties and we met there, Arden was running the film school and then uh, he asked me to come and help out because I was do also doing some film work at the time. Mm. And then uh, we were both just really uh, into music and so were our friends. And so little by little we uh, started to um, get into that. So was um, the Boutique Electronic Club Night, was that your first um, collaboration together? Yeah, yeah, I think we used to have these Wednesday uh, cinema nights uh, that were run by the film school. And then after the, the film was being screened, there'd be jam sessions, mm. mixing sort of like all sorts of African music with live percussion, MCs, the sort of organic. Um, yeah, there were small parties that were on Wednesday nights and um, yeah. some of the ones that first started growing, attracting uh, young people who are into different forms of music they couldn't normally hear around the city. Um, yeah. So it was those Wednesday nights that then became the Pika Electronique and then we started doing them across the city in bigger venues and on weekends. Mm -hmm. um, so it was very much the start. How did you... Um find your place in the Kampala music scene, especially um, one that was kind of outside of uh, the country's more commercial reggae, dancehall, hip hop infrastructure. Because you, you, you were bringing together like all different styles of East African music and kind of micro scenes, but then <clears throat> also kind of Western, Western music trends like grime and and techno and so how 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 was it forming a community around that i mean i think in the beginning that it wasn't just about music it was also just a bit of a, a social uh you know reality that uh, you know if you don't find the kind of people you you want to hang out with or the kind of parties you want to see or you you the kind of music you make is not being played in the different clubs so i think it was just a time where a lot of different people were doing their things on the side, but everybody just wanted to, you know, congregate in certain places. And parties is, is usually the first sort of avenue for, you know, anyway, that everybody was going to parties, but the parties just weren't, uh, they were always a little bit similar. And uh, there were certain DJs that wanted to play their music, but couldn't, you know, certain crowds wouldn't mix, or, you know, parties were too expensive, or just a, a, a set of things that made for at some point, everybody started to hang out at the same place and bring mm. their music and organize little events and invite other people. And then from there, things materialized a bit more concretely. So yeah, what were your um, like initial intentions for the imprint, like for Nyege Nyege tapes? I'm, I'm sensing that it grew out of this club night. You started building a community and then you guys thought we can do something with this. I mean, the label was because you need, you need a you need a window to to advertise what you're doing, right? I mean, the label is not something that was directly necessary into our daily lives. 
or into the buildup of our community. But once there was something to be shared, then the label seemed to be a logical outlet, quite a simple one to start, um, you know, yeah, I guess just sharing what was, uh, what was happening, what we were making, what we were about. Yeah. I think also like, because the nightlife economy in Kampala is very much about numbers, even though a lot of the music that was being played and the audience were maybe on the margins of general Kampala nightlife, once the numbers started growing, it was an easy way to start getting into bigger venues and having bigger promoters or venues be attracted to what we were doing. Can, so, I, actually, can I actually just interrupt and ask what kind of scale you guys were um, evolving to and from in terms of like the, the audiences over there? From about 40, 50 people. Mm -hmm. The get, then grew to about maybe a hundred people in the first little small venue that we were doing parties to about four or five hundred within the, um, the first six months when we started moving out to exploring other venues and started to take mm -hmm. over like abandoned warehouses mm -hmm. in the industrial district. Um, which also come with a set of uh, issues that any underground format finds in their own, you know, context is that the bigger you are, you know, you need bigger venues with different rules. You know, with maybe already existing audiences. So we, we, we always sort of advocated for a no compromise scenario, you know, so finding venues was a bit harder, but so naturally the parties would be a bit smaller. We, it was never the intent to sort of take over the party scene, you know, yeah. just have a, a space where uh, things would be different. Also safety could be advocated for, you know, like this different different things around how we congregate around music that we could test out rather than being sort of gobbled up into bigger things that then always tend to be diluted in a way. Yeah. And there's a lot of different things now. So we organize less parties because there's a lot more of those sort of parties happening. There's a lot more diversity in uh, the sort of party scene of Kampara now than I feel there was before. Yeah. Where it was either the club or a house party. And uh, now there's just a lot of events, promoters, new DJs, just more diversity. So we feel it's less uh, important for us to organize parties. Mm. So is your, do you feel like your focus is more with um, the, the two labels that you have, Nyege Nyege Tapes and Hikuna Kalala? Is your focus shifting more onto that and the, the artist yeah. residencies? The yeah, also, operations. Yeah. yeah, also a lot of artists that are not on the label, but that are sort of working in the periphery of it, you know, in our community and just to support more, more access, more platforms, you know, more and more music being made, but uh, not necessarily it doesn't have to be a negative. So I could not like that's a little bit at this point outside of um, really our, our vision, you know, the vision is just for something more general to be accessible and to be, you know, shared and experienced and not to be, you know, the two labels that kind of, you know, have their own, their own you know, direction. But uh, as the people behind it, we're really concerned about uh, just things spreading around and being more accessible. I mm -hmm. think also the, the more we engage with artists, uh, be it through a release, then the, the necessity of building a sustainable career um or a yes a sustainable ecosystem for the artists to continue on what they're doing takes uh priority um so whether it's touring or all those avenues i mean one's always aware that if you or to some extent direct someone's energies into starting to make music at the when they're like 20 and then they've done it for five years and then things don't work out well that's five years they've lost so there's a certain obligation to make sure this environment is conducive to build on what they've started yeah, yeah. i mean it in terms of our priorities sorry um, in terms of our priorities i think what arden is saying is to to crack the economics you know around you know music from the continent and how it's being sold abroad and how it's being consumed and you know how can we make it beneficial and more beneficial to uh, to whatever it is you know the to the artist here but you know, so these are different, totally different paths. On one side, you try and see how can I create new spaces for my artists, 
you know, to expand on their income and on their visibility. And on the other side, how to create bigger markets here locally, which mm. are, you know, different, um, have different uh, lifelines. Because it definitely feels like you have quite a unique model in the way that you do things like communities at the center a little bit more than your average record label artist exchange. Um, it doesn't feel, even though you're both Europeans, it doesn't feel like a Western label picking up the music and kind of trying to just import it um, into, the, into the European market. It seems like there's more of like a nurturing incubation period. You've got your recording studio, um, the residencies, the platform of the festival. I guess, because I saw, I saw, um, I read something you mentioned, Derek, about wanting to avoid being thrown into like the world music category. Mm. Yeah, but, um, because because there is that uh, view that uh, certain types, culturally speaking, certain types of um, aesthetics of how Africa views itself as something that can be exported, that uh, that have become kind of the norm, and you guys, you guys, as positive interference in this have, as I think, really evolved the conversation into something else in this regard. Yeah. I mean, it's always been our desire not to be locked into any uh, particular box or a particular narrative. And maybe in a sense we've succeeded because initially we didn't have, there was no plan. It was really just a passion for music, a lot of camaraderie, uh, you know, and uh, just the desire to make music really, and uh, to play it and to hear it and to share it. Mm -hmm. uh, it was never the idea of, you know, starting a label or this or this. Of course, when you see your friends have talent and and they, they're underappreciated locally, and you feel there might be you know, an audience for them somewhere, you start to envisage that, okay, how can I make it happen? But initially, it was always about music, and uh, all the people that uh, we are part of our community are just into music heavily. Yeah. And, into, and, and so not into business, or not into you know, politicizing it, and, but as you enter new spaces, you have to consider. Exactly. You know, so that's what I was kind of getting towards with the, um, with the world music category. I'm like within a kind of post-colonial framework, what ways can we avoid like the othering of these music styles when they're met by a European gaze mm -hmm. um, to kind of give them a bit more Longevity within European markets alone. There was probably two things that were happening simultaneously, which was one was a, there was already a lot of existing forms of music on the continent, the one being represented because existing <laughs> labels or platforms felt like it didn't fit into the world music sort of category, which was the normal way that a lot of music was marketed from the continent. But whether it was like in the late 90s, early 2000s, Kuduro in Angola, the, at that point, a lot of it didn't come out or it didn't come out in, the, in a way or on a platform where a lot of these people could start touring. And at the same time, at the moment when we started, there was just so much of that kind of different music coming out, much more club focused, stuff that could fit into a techno club in Europe or, you know, or, you know deconstructed club music or these sort of terms mm -hmm. that have been popular in the last like five, six years. So. There was just a lot more of it happening and that was also sort of music that we were very much interested in not only but to some extent so it, it was also a natural process of people realizing that wow okay there's there's a lot more wealth and breadth in music happening from the global periphery and we're seeing not just africa right now obviously like you know in, in, throughout the global south um mm. but i think also the importance of touring and touring a lot of these artists in non-conventional contexts so them playing in sort of newer festivals were arising, you know, around that same time, but much more, you know, wider focus of curation and, and you know, a wider definition of what club music might be. So I think the music in itself did a lot of that work. Yeah. Just by being different. Because you guys work with a lot of kind of micro scenes within themselves. Um, mm -hmm. For example, you showcase music from like various Ugandan 
um, tribes, mm -hmm. but then you'll also release stuff from South Africa. Um, and then you'll do collaborations with like local, like London heroes, like Lord Tusk, for example. Mm -hmm. Do you, how do you, how is it like marketing all of those different styles of music within East Af like within East Africa, but then also within the continent on the whole? How do, how do people receive it? I think on the one hand, there's also an othering of music locally or within the continent. So mm -hmm. something like a Charlie traditional wedding music, which in the last 10 years has, has been transplanted into kind of electronic music production due to local economic constraints has would not be traditionally uh, consumed on the dance floor here in Uganda. Right. And, you know, one thing in the festival when they hear our team alpha, you know, on the tropical disco stage at 4 a.m. in the morning or in Katerblau in Berlin in a, in a techno club, and it comes on at 4 a.m. But in the Ugandan context, for people also to be able to bring that music in a very different context and for people to enjoy it. Uh, was also sort of like breaking certain like other rings that say or like yeah. sort of stereotypes that oh that's music that only a Charlie people would listen to at their weddings and it's not for us necessarily or so I mean locally you know the music market is very much dominated by major players uh telecom companies the major tv channels Tr trace tv and right. MTV Africa and I think in general, there's been a, it's, it's been quite difficult for underground music to break through into wider markets. To, mm -hmm. And in some respects, it's easier in Europe where there's you know, many more independent promoters and more channels that champion underground music. Mm -hmm. yeah. And also, it feels like sometimes uh, there is um, still, and of course, speaking outside, outside your reality, but it seems that there's this self deprecation sometimes in terms of either you're massive and you're hugely accessible and visible or there's no room kind of in the middle um, for, 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 for stuff to emerge. Yeah, uh, emerge. Maybe. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And uh, you guys, you guys for sure have really, really dynamic way of occupied this nether zone, which is super mm -hmm. volatile and again, dynamic. That uh, I think is kind of the, the bridge between just uh, doing music for kicks, just for fun, for your friends, and uh, to win. And you guys have, for sure, for a lot of people, made it viable uh, to do something in between that and being a mainstream pop icon type of uh, character. Yeah. At the same time, it's challenging when you're like, you know, working with, let's say, the sort of like the pioneers of Singeli music, whose sound is much harder. And now they're witnessing mm -hmm. in the last four years Singeli blow up in Tanzania, but it's the more watered down versions mm -hmm. of, you know, Singeli that are becoming popular. And, you know, they don't fit into that. And then they start seeing the European market as the main audience for them to expand in. Right. Um, so it creates all these dichotomies as well. Mm. Um, at the end of the day, everyone wants to blow up, you know, in their home turf. Uh, it's a form of self-validation that, that beats anything else. Um, but um, yeah, those are challenges that you know are just there, and it's um, there's things that we're trying to figure out here as well. Given how yeah. important it's for, our, for artists here to feel that they're also being championed and accepted um, from where they're from. Um, yeah. Um, what are your what are your plans for the festival this year? What's what's going on with that? Big plans. Big plans. <laughs> <laughs> now we're going to do something really exciting this year uh, we're talking with the ministry of health now and the government to uh you know kind of look at what the festival is going to have to uh how it's going to take form in september most likely a very limited audience mm -hmm. uh, most likely we're going to have an all ugandan based lineup which is also very exciting for us and then we're going to see how to sort of bring in um any sort of international partners and audience to uh, some you sort feel of like that that could be a possibility. Bringing in, yeah, definitely. I think uh, I think it's a possibility. It's all about just engaging ahead of time with the government and health officials, mm. so not to put anybody's health in jeopardy. But uh, this will only know in August 
whether there will be events limited to 50 people, to 500 people, whether we can, um, wh whether it's only going to be for Ugandans. So right now we're mostly sort of setting it up, uh, an online component and a physical component, and hopefully we'll be able to propose some sort of hybrid experience where people can really sort of witness the festival from, from online, but also locally. I know we get messages every day about, uh, you know, people just wanting to beat Corona so they can come to the festival. So we just, we have to stay positive and I think we'll be able to work something out. Mm. Um, have you kind of, so how does that feed into putting lineups together at the moment? It, it's, it's- Yeah, I mean, as I said, uh, we, we've always uh, had a big focus on local music, but not so much the mainstream one. And uh, now we're just going to package something together that has both, you know, kind of classic Ugandan bands, mainstream pop stars, DJs, you know, some of the hip hop underground. There's a lot of cool stuff there, some jazz. So it's just going to be a showcase of Ugandan music. And uh, we feel that there's enough just in Uganda to uh, to put together a festival. So yeah, exactly. it makes sense. Mm. How How is everything with the residencies? Are you still... Yeah, the house is packed. Uh, we have 16 people now in residency. Uh, we have eight uh, musicians from Congo. Uh, there's our in-house producers, Sapien, Zilla, Christman, Romy. Uh, a couple of MCs doing short residences that came to move into the villa. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, everybody's busy. Jonathan Saldana, uh, you're going to see his project HHY in the Makumba at the end of the, the stream. Kampala. Kampala unit, sorry. He's here. He extended his stay. So, I mean, for us, the model has completely changed in a way that before bookings were the goal and now bookings are no longer existent and yeah. it might be for a long time, you know, like we could see Europe, our, our main markets, giving more room to their own local artists. So the main thing we can do is make, make, make more music because for that we have the facilities and obviously financially it's a bit of a... Of, uh, you know, it's not easy to, to run all these operations, but, you know, in terms of the artists, they're in the perfect conditions to just keep churning out work. And hopefully later on there will be bookings or not, but we, we imagine a world where there are no tours in Europe anymore, ever. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, it's good for European audiences to also understand that, you know, that uh, the economics of it were already very difficult. The politics of it were very difficult, but it can be that maybe you know, you can experience the world without culture from coming from the continent, you know, and understanding what that also means, you know, in terms of wanting to consume it in a different way or, you know, like just interacting it with different, in a different way. And hopefully, you know, that, uh, that's going to make us think about what it means to, 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 you know, use the online space as a last resort to mm. meet. Because uh, anyway, before, culture has always been you know, very close to many people and maybe the internet is just going to allow, you know, different alliances, different communities. You know, I don't think that the museum would have been able to bring all these artists over. So, you know, maybe this, you know, when we consider visa issues, when we consider costs, when we consider all these things, there might be something positive to look forward to. And uh, maybe it will bring more people to also come here to experience culture from, from the original point. Mm. At least when it comes to this and we will not have to talk about how is it exported and how is it commodified because it just won't be that that that's readily available anymore mm. maybe so i think there's a lot of questions around you know like what our industry is looking for uh, looking you know looking like but uh, for artists here resilience is the is the modus operandi so you know, it's not going to change well, it's, yeah. it's, it's really cool in that regard in a sense where uh, in, in obviously a speculative future. Like if one decides to go there to, to check out what's going on in Kampala, it, it really, if, if, if it goes down the, the way you're in, suggesting, uh, it really implies like a heavy interest in what's going on as opposed to a more volatile, more superficial, mm -hmm. uh, commodifying kind of attitude of just the the traveling all around, consuming this, consuming that, with, with um, yeah. without much depth. So that that might be really cool, for sure. Yeah. 
And I think as a festival, we've never made it to be a festival for tourists. So, you know, we, we have an audience here that is ready to come for this festival, even if it means just having Ugandan acts and mm -hmm. having you know, some, some streaming going on of you know, inter international acts, uh, you know, plugging in and playing. But uh, also in Europe, I think, you know, bigger festivals are, are no longer, you know, they were already a hindrance in a way, you know, to smaller venues. So maybe things will just take a more humane side. And uh, when it comes to online interaction, we'll also find ways to make it work. Sure. Um, just Pedro, how are we doing for time? Um, we it's rescheduled. Time we, we rescheduled for for this to uh, to finish at five thirty, given okay. that we had this massive delay. And again, apologies to everyone who was kept waiting, including you guys. People are <laughs> complaining. It's like they're having a conference before a club night. <laughs> <laughs> it's welcome to post postmodernity. <laughs> now it's mandatory. First okay. the conference. Than, than the music. I think um, it would be interesting to talk about the production of the festival, the kind of more behind the scenes work that goes into it, maybe also before this, the, before we were under these conditions. Um, what, kind of, what kinds of things do you come up against? Um, I mean, I think it's just the economics of it to try and keep something that has a left field element that is essentially non-commercial, but to make it accessible and to grow it in a way that is meaningful economically to the artist, you know, that's the thing you have to juggle with. And it's not a, it's not a very straightforward recipe. So, you know, it's easy to do something that will sell more tickets. It's easy to raise the price of the tickets. It's easy to, you know, downsize the program or, but, there's a thing you, we want to achieve and to figure out how it's economically viable when, you know, sponsors can come in and out, when, you know, your audience doesn't have necessarily the means to, to sustain it economically. So to, to patch it all together, I think, and, and not to try not to compromise as much as possible. Um, that is really the challenge, I think. Yeah, I think also to try and maintain an audience that's very diverse, that Obviously, in, in, in economies where there's a lot of disparities, it can sometimes be a bit more challenging. Um, then more the more obvious things, obviously, there was no festival industry established. A lot of festivals in Europe will just tap into an existing industry. Yeah, where exactly. obvious things like, you know, everything from ticketing to, you know, sanitary solutions and all that. So everything sort of had to be figured out the ground up. But even that's changed in the, in the five years we've been on operation. With more festivals popping up and you know people are very enterprising so these sort of solutions start popping up then maybe uh just when the sort of a national rave culture emerges in any society whether it was the uk or you know america or you know or uganda for that sake people do get confused exactly what it is why people like up and partying for four days and everyone's mixing together and sleeping in tents and that kind of stuff and then to sort of assuage you know authorities about what it is and what it means and why it's happening and sort of you know the sort of moral dilemmas that arise i think from the birth of any rave culture in any society uh in uganda was no different mm. can i actually ask you guys what's the what's the the, the media uh, feedback you have locally uh in in uganda and the countries bordering on in uganda yeah it's great only positive, we've been like event of the year in the mo multiple sort of media outlets. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a very stable media partner, a bit, one of the biggest TV stations here. And uh, no, I mean, the media is very supportive. I mean, they also understand that the general narrative of the festival is very positive for the region. Mm -hmm. And they understand, you know, how tourism can expand from it. They understand the economics of the creative sector. So. I think in, in terms of media, we, we really have no, um, no problems. Cool. Yeah. We have a bunch of people here, by the way, if uh, you want to talk to some of the artists Shannon, that uh, are in the, in the villa. Yeah, that would be great. Because the villa is like the hub, isn't it? Yeah. Maybe I can turn the camera. Sapiens, you don't the villa? Let me call Sapiens, one of our oldest members. Oh, uh, yeah. 
And Darlene, you, know, you also want to come? come, come, come. <laughs> so this is Ray Sapiens. Hey. Ray Sapiens, hey. And uh, Darlene, aka hey. DK producer DK. And uh, they both here at the house uh, making music, performing. They also got a lot of shows canceled. Mm. But uh, yeah, so basically. Uh, uh, Wait, you just, uh, did a, you just did a boiler room, didn't you? Yes, we both did. I think yeah, yeah, has yeah. another one coming up. You know? <laughs> you got another one? Yeah, I have another one coming soon. Yeah, I've not, I've not really like tapped into all of the streams yet. I really need to watch that back. I yeah. loved your um, performance at the, at the end of Nyege Nyege last year. Um, it was what one of the last performances of the festival, wasn't it? Yeah. In the morning on Monday. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there was like confetti and everything. It was really special. Yeah. yeah, it was. It really was. Um, what are you guys working on at the moment? Um, right now I'm working on an album. Of course, I can pass. Working on an album. Uh, it's coming soon. Um, some music videos. Yeah. Can yeah, actually add more music, just music. All the time. Yeah. Sakyan yeah. is also our resident sort of like uh, Ableton teacher. So he's been a lot of, like giving tips to a lot of people who are also working on their production. Yeah. Okay. Can, can, uh, can we ask uh, you, the, the three of you, broadly, um, if, if you guys would be into um, talking a bit about how your personal relationship with the Niega Niega and these two pirates um, uh, kind of came through and how it has affected uh, the way you, um, you look at uh, music making, uh, the way you look at the future of your career, let's call it that. Um, after they showed up in Africa. And, and by the way, if I can ask you guys to move a bit closer to the microphone, that would be great. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Much better. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I met with Derek and Alan mm -hmm. uh, six years ago. Then when I was doing other, other music, but it was hard since I met them, I started start pushing me up. And after that, uh, one year after that, I started production. And the parties and the music and the and the parties and the music, which plays also Yogi Nyogi like Pacific Electronic when it started, it inspired inspired me a lot. It gave me a style, and I think that was the best. And when I start production, a lot of advice from friends. Uh, Alan, Derek, it, it, it really pushed music and yeah, not only me and many other people also got inspired and making some nice stuff over Africa too. Yeah, yeah so my name is Chris Mann. Uh, I also uh, came to Uganda, it's like it's been one year. Since I came, I came last year in April. So from Congo. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, I'm from Congo. So I came yeah. here, uh, like uh, to just uh, pursue my vision because uh, I used to do music in Congo, but uh, there was a lot of issues of, uh, you know, like I was doing, but. Uh, some issue, the issue was uh, a lot. And uh, I just said, uh, let me try to move to another country and try if uh, things gonna work. 
And then fortunately, I met Derek and Allen, and then uh, they supported my music. And now we are working on a big project on my first album. And yeah, yeah that's going to be really cool. Yeah. Terrific. Terrific. Mm, I also met Derek uh, just before he had the idea for the first Megan Nagas, which is 2016. Um, I'm a multidisciplinary artist. I do photograph photography and installation, but after being around the Nyege Nyege crew and just being around music and seeing that it's not this like difficult thing and that everyone has their like whatever your point of view is is valid and that it's welcome and people want to hear it. Um, really sort of like inspired me to also start DJing and also start making music. Also seeing my best friend become one of like the best DJs from Uganda, the best like biggest export DJs from Uganda to the world to take up here. It really, I was like, oh, if she can do it, I can also, I also have like some music I wanted to say. Yeah. So it was just like that idea of like access, it was just it's so easy and so mm -hmm. present, but it didn't become this special thing anymore. So I really appreciate that. Yeah. Really think that that's incredible. Yeah. I had that same kind of moment with um, DJing as well. Kind of the more women that I could see doing it, it stopped feeling so inaccessible. Um, felt more of like a, yeah, I was just like, oh, I can do it as well, you know? Yeah. And that, that your point of view is valid, you know, that whatever you like, exactly. there is no audience for that, you know? It's not, oh, like, the, you know, there's not this set thing, it didn't have to be in. Whatever you want to play, whatever you want to do, there's an audience for that. Yeah. What is your um, day to day looking like? Because I feel like you guys are in kind of a lucky situation here where <laughs> you're For in. Sure. Yeah, because I'm, I'm kind of here by myself in London. Um, so the idea of being in a villa with like a studio, like a bunch, like a music community, just making work. I'm not going to lie, like it makes me feel jealous. <laughs> But what's your what's your day today been like? Yeah, we've been uh, just I guess the same because it didn't really feel like we're in quarantine, so it's just the same days. People mm. make music. Um, Sapiens is starting a garden. We're going to grow some food. Um, a guy from Fulham Music are building a new instrument recently, so they were starting to like play with it. Uh, there's a bad, we have badminton, people play a lot of badminton. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jonathan, who is with HHY and the uh, Kampalans, gives Tai Chi lessons. So some people have been doing that. Um, it's just, it just didn't feel that uh, different from mm. any other. Yeah, at least for me. It's not different. It's, uh, we're making music, I think, by the end of time, we have a few token, token now of music. <laughs> yeah. do, you, do, you, do, you, do a lot of you live in the villa most of the time anyway? Is that why it doesn't feel that different? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we, we live, yeah, most of the time we make music. Um, uh, Ray, Ray is the villa manager, so he's been here since. I don't know how long it's been, exactly. know, maybe like since the beginning of the villa. Um, Chris also has been in residence in the villa for like a year now. That's one thing I noticed when I was there as well. Like a lot of people just don't want to leave. <laughs> I'm not saying that to you as, <laughs> as anything, but I mean, even, I was just like, there's just such like a powerful creative energy um, going on between all of you. It feels good to be around it, you know? Definitely. The only thing I think different is that there's not that many people coming by. Because usually you would always have, that villa was even cooler than the people who live here, even though there's like 15 people who live here. There was always more people. Yeah. But now, because people can't travel, so, the, not so many people come. So it's just us. 
also because all that tours were cancelled people aren't also leaving that yeah yeah on tour so that Villa can always be so cool so it's just been like at max capacity <laughs> for the mm-hmm. first time to have been cool I think it's also hard because no one can also go so everyone stay um, we just start and the residents stay the same but I think it's good also other people came to the residency so they get to know music and get deep in what yeah. I mean. um, <laughs> There are a lot of collaborations going down at the moment. Uh, That's really exciting. I can't, I can't wait to hear. I can't wait to hear what comes it, out of this. It's like these guys are in paradise and we're all stuck in our really? like one, one bedroom <laughs> apartments in, in the cities. Yeah. So it's not fair. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> it's not. You're right. Um, Chen, just um, just to, to know when we have to go in a couple of minutes. And um, uh, before, before you wrap it up, Shannon, um, I just want to mention to who's watching that um, uh, our media partner for, for this is NTS, um, who if people want to, to tune into uh, as well, uh, between 6 and 8 p.m. London time, you can on NTS One. And uh, we just wanted to, to give a shout out to NTS and really appreciate their uh, collaboration on this one. But uh, if, if we could wrap it up in the next couple of minutes. Yeah, so to round it up, I'll just say thank you to everyone for getting involved. It was a really interesting conversation. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. It was so nice to meet you all as well. Uh, yeah, thank you, you Shannon. Thank, um, <laughs> thank you, guys, because it, 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 it turns out it's... Oh. <laughs> I really wanted to get the talk, to be honest, but I don't think we have time. We're ready for the party to get started. Okay, okay. <laughs> Let's do that then. Okay, cool. So thank you so um, much. Thank you really. The, the, shall I just introduce the? There's going to be a live stream uh, program following now um, with six different artists from six different countries across the world. So we have Menzi from Durban, South Africa, DJ Diaki from Mali, Jay Mitta and MC Antivirus from Tanzania. DJ Chengs from St. Lucia, um, Jacko Maran from Reunion Island, and HHY in the Kampala unit coming out of Uganda, Portugal, and Congo. <laughs> <laughs> I'm interested to see how that um, is going to go down. But yeah, thank you to everyone for watching as well. And thank you, Pedro, for organizing. The whole thank thing. Bye, guys. All you guys. All you guys are beautiful. Thank you so much. See you soon. Bye. Ciao. Bye. 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 Bye.